And I'll call to order this committee of the whole meeting and uh, welcome all members and welcome everyone who is uh, joining us on the live stream this evening. We're glad that you're with us. Um, the second item on the agenda is disclosures of pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if you have a pecuniary interest you'd like to declare. Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions, deletions, or amendments. We have no open forum. We do have one delegation. And it's from Mar Margot Thompson and Ian Bainbridge uh, from the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories decommission about decommissioning the original Douglas Point. So we'll uh, turn the floor over to Margot and to uh, Ian. Okay, thank, thank you, Mayor Charbonneau and Council. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so can everybody see that and hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Okay, so again, thank you. And my name is Margot Thompson and I work in communications with Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. And I'm here, well, virtually here uh, this evening with Ian Bainbridge, the Director of Reactor Decommissioning with CNL. And we are here this evening mm -hmm. to share a bit of information about CNL's plans to uh, decommission the original Douglas Point reactor facility. And that's in advance of an upcoming license amendment application hearing with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. While most or all of you are probably familiar with the Douglas Point facility, um, and I think some of you are familiar with CNL's decommissioning proposal, either through the County of Bruce uh, meeting that we attended back in uh, February or through public webinars, um, not everyone may be aware of our project or even of CNL organization. So we were scheduled to speak to council last spring, but I think everybody's plans have changed since last March. So, so we're here this evening. Uh, tonight we'll try and give a brief overview of our organization and the decommission plans and what we've heard from the community so far. And then we'll leave you with a number of resources uh, where you can find additional information. And it's very important, and Ian will uh, reiterate this, but it's very important that we um, create an awareness about the project early on and learn from the community uh, in this planning process. And this way we can ensure that community interests and um, concerns are incorporated into the plans. And that's why we're grateful for this opportunity. So with that, I'm going to move on. Oh, I covered the overview outline of today's presentation move on to uh, this map is of CNL sites. And these are CNL managed sites because they're actually owned by a name that you may be more familiar with. Uh, that's Atomic Energy of Canada or AACL. And so who is CNL? Uh, we have around 3000 staff and our operations span across Canada, as you can see. Uh, there are a few other sites that aren't on this map um, in New Brunswick as well. And as a nuclear familiar community, you're probably familiar with uh, our main campus and that's Chalk River Laboratories in the Ottawa Valley. That's kind of the nu nuclear birthplace in Canada. So there's a lot of connections between the two regions. And um, most of our workforce were ACL employees until we transitioned to our current model, which is uh, GOCO, government owned contractor operated. And that was in 2015. So all of these sites and associated assets are owned by ACL, the Federal Crown Corporation, as I mentioned before. And CNL, that's us, we have the contract, the long-term contract to manage these sites and operations. And each one of these sites has an environmental remediation component, meaning there is government owned uh, waste liabilities in all of these locations. And that means CNL is responsible for cleaning up these sites and appropriately managing the waste on these sites or generated in decommissioning projects uh, like we're proposing here at Douglas Point. So at this point, I'll turn it over to the expert, that's uh, Ian. Uh, Ian? Is Ian still with us? We may, 
we may have lost Ian. I don't see him on there. Is he still, do you still see him, Linda? Okay, well, that's okay. I can, I can continue with the presentation. Sure. Um, not used to doing the clicking. Okay. <laughs> so um, I think mostly everybody here is probably familiar with the location of Douglas Point. So it's in the municipality of King Carden in Bruce County. It's the, a neighbor of the town of Saugeen Shores. And the Douglas Point site, as I mentioned before, it's an ACL owned site and it's about 5.5 hectares and it's located within the middle of the Bruce Power site, uh, which, is, which is much bigger. Uh, the Douglas Point site is about, or the Bruce Power site rather, is about 150 times the size of the Douglas Point site. So you can see here the map of Bruce County and um, the map on the right is the Douglas Point, uh, the larger Bruce Power Facility with the red box being the uh, footprint of the Douglas Point site. Okay. okay, and so this is kind of a neat photo. Um, on the left, we have the reactor facility in the 1970s, early 70s. And on the right, we have it just about a year ago in last November and a couple of the current team members down at the, down at the point. And uh, Ian usually does this part in the presentation and he always remarks that the shrubs have grown a little bit, but other than that, not much else has changed. So again, we might already know a little bit about the history, but uh, Douglas Point was Canada's first full-scale nuclear power plant. And it was a joint project between Atomic Energy of Canada Limited and Ontario Hydro, now OPG, Ontario Power Generation. It was a 200 uh, megawatt prototype candy reactor and it ran from 1967 to 1984. And by 1986, the fuel was removed and reactor coolant was drained. So that sort of ended the, the first phase of decommissioning, um, that, in, that initial fuel transfer into dry storage. And that was done by the end of 1987. And then the phase two, which is the current phase that we're still in right now is known as uh, storage with surveillance phase. So we have staff on site that are maintaining the facility uh, in a safe shutdown state, but, um, and we, there are some waste removal activities that go on within that license, but other than that, uh, not a lot goes on. So certain things are important, like maintaining the, the, um, the, the structures and the emergency facilities like uh, uh, fire detection and that kind of thing. So this, right. what we're Margo. Oh, hi. hi. Ian, you're back. So I see you. My connection okay. has restored if you uh, want me to take over at that point. Sorry about I that. I do, but, yeah, um, perfect. My hotel internet connection is not that good. Um, Excellent. So, Thank no, you. I think you've done great on that one. Um, so, I, I'd pop on to the next slide, Margo, see if we keep it moving. You're doing very well. So, so the decommissioning plan um, the intention here is to remove everything that's at the site. Um, at least down to as far as bedrock. Um, in some cases, um, they, they, they built the foundations onto the bedrock and we will we'll remove those foundations down to the bedrock, but where they uh, blasted or dug into the bedrock, um, we will go down to make sure there's no contamination left. Uh, but if there's a solid concrete structure there, part of the foundation, the intention is to prove it's clean and then leave it there and we'll eventually fill all the holes back up to the level of bedrock with concrete and then and put a layer of earth across the top. Um, so that's thinking right now uh, with all the stakeholders, very much including yourselves and the indigenous group, just to see, is there anything extra we want to include in these plans or is there anything specific you'd like us to consider as we go forward with this decommissioning? The, I'll get to the actual decommission process very shortly, um, but it is a phased approach. Right now we're looking for um, a license amendment, but then each of the phases, there'd be five distinct phases, which we've got a slide on in a, in a slide or two. Uh, but initially uh, the work we'll do in the next few years, we'll be removing the non-nuclear buildings. Um, these are already empty. They're effectively large warehouses, same as you'd find on any industrial site. Um, and an old uh, office building that's now been cleared out and it's just literally an empty office building. Um, 
we then move on um, to the other works. Uh, just one back one a minute, Margot, please. Sorry. I, yeah. Um, and so the goal is certainly to have everything finished by 2070. We expect to have the majority of it finished much sooner than that. But there are things such as the fuel, um, which depend on the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. It may take us a little longer but, uh, uh, actually get the fuel moved from the site to the disposal facility 70. We're obviously looking to bring that forward as best. Great care with our wastes. Uh, the majority of this will be uh, not completely non-radioactive. And what we found in the past, the vast majority of that, well over 90%, is actually recycled. The concrete is reused, the steel is recycled, um, uh, and the soils, uh, once we've proven clean, we put them back uh, and help to restore the site as it was. So, next, please, Margo. Yeah. So the license amendment. Um, we applied for this uh, just over a year ago now. Uh, to ask the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to change it effectively from a storage and surveillance license where we just look after the place to an actual decommissioning license, which uh, in regulatory space allows us to move forward with the decommissioning. Uh, and that there's a hearing planned for that, again, because of COVID, it's been put off once or twice, but it's now going to happen November 25th and 26th. Um, and as I mentioned before, that in itself won't allow us to do decommissioning but it will allow us to submit requests for to allow us to do phases of decommissioning so, please margo timeline as apologies a little little small on the slide here uh, but the website's Mark, I'll show you later. Uh, you can get in. The, uh, so we're going for the license of the uh, doing the decommissioning. Ten years away, if not longer, before we can start on those ones. So there is a phase plan uh, that will last uh, a decade, probably at least two of concentrated work, uh, and eventually we'll get to the point at 2070. We can say it's it's all removed. Uh, we've proven the site is now back to the state it was as best. Sorry, Ian, I think you're breaking up a bit. Yeah, it seems we're, lo we're losing Ian here. Why don't uh, Margo, you carry on and uh, and hopefully he can catch back up to us. Sure. Um, so. Please can we terminate our license and we'll hand that then back to our client. It may be... Uh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this essentially shows the footprints of the buildings that we're planning to decommission. And as Ian was mentioning, it's a phased approach and um, everything labeled A would be considered the first phase, the first sub phase of the five planning envelopes, which we'd, uh, if we are permitted to move forward, we would be doing these buildings first and then we'd move on to B, C, uh, and then D and E would be our plan for post 2030. And that's the reactor building itself and the spent fuel canister area. Okay. And so I won't uh, go into too much here, but I will discuss a little bit the environmental protection at Douglas Point. Um, so we're included in the site ERA for Bruce Power, that's environmental risk assessment. Um, there's very, very small releases to air and water currently, um, less than 0.01% of the derived release limits, which are standard set by the federal regulator. Um, and there's no anticipated impact during decommissioning to fish from uh, thermal emissions or deleter deleterious substances or any fish impingent or entrainment, which is always a concern when we're talking about decommissioning on uh, Lake Huron. There haven't been any species at risk identified at the site, at our site, um, of course, at the wider sea, 
site there may be, but uh, not in the Douglas Point footprint. And migratory birds um, are a biggest issue at the site from a biodiversity perspective. So we've got plans in um, incorporated into the decommissioning to manage that. So we're not negatively impacting the migratory birds. Okay, so this is back to my area of specialty. <laughs> uh, so as I said at the beginning, engaging with the local public and indigenous communities is a big priority, it's especially early on at this phase in the planning process. And um, we are working to build long-term relationships with the Indigenous peoples that have traditional territories and modern day interests near Douglas Point. We begin, we begin to initiate engagement with the public in the region. We started reaching out uh, last, the beginning of, beginning of this year um, to local municipalities and the County Council. And uh, we've also been hosting different uh, community events throughout the summer. Um, and we will be doing so into the fall as well. Uh, we have a virtual open house plan for October and I'll, I'll go into that more in a bit detail later. Um, and then of course, today we're reaching out to inform our local governments and elected officials. And www.cnl.ca slash DP uh, is the main hub of information on the project. And if you have any questions about the project or upcoming activities, ERM stakeholder at cnl.ca is where to find us. And I did say we go into a bit about what we've heard so far from these engagements, and I won't spend too long on this. I know we've already probably eaten up most of our 10 minutes, uh, but I will highlight a couple. You already mentioned, um, but these, these groups are most of the themes of concerns and interests we've heard from the community and Indigenous people so far. Uh, the waste, where will the non-radioactive waste will go and how much there is of that has been a big concern. Uh, we've said that non-radioactive waste from that first planning envelope with the non-nuclear buildings um, was planned to go to community landfills. And most of it, most of the waste generated actually isn't waste. It um, can be reused or recycled, but some of it will be. So what we're doing is we're reaching out to stakeholders and we're meeting uh, we've sent information and we're really looking for a solution that will be mutually agreeable with, with interested stakeholders and concerned stakeholders. Another big question, and Ian mentioned this too, is the is about the used fuel. And um, we have uh, been telling people that this is really dependent on the timeline for what we'll do with the spent fuel at Douglas Point is dependent on the nuclear waste management organizations long-term solution for Canada's nuclear fuel. So um, there will be decisions based on uh, what decisions are made with the NWMO. Okay, and everything is available publicly on the Town of Sogging Shores website. So I won't go into detail here. And I've already mentioned how, we're how what our answers are to these questions. And again, this will all be available publicly through the town's website. Actually, it already is available. And the key upcoming dates. So we mentioned this license amendment hearing in November. So uh, anyone can participate and that's called the intervention and the deadline to request for inter intervene in the hearing is October 26, 2020. And in the lead up to that, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission will be holding, uh, what they've already holded, hosted one webinar and they'll be hosting another in mid-October and we will be doing our virtual open house. And if you check our social media and uh, website for those dates. They'll be there very soon. And more details on how to participate in that hearing are there on the website as well. So again, these are the resources and do reach out to um, us via email or social media. If you have any, any questions, we're happy to provide answers. And again, we're really looking for feedback at this point when we can incorporate them into the longer term planning. And thank you so much. And um, I will mute myself now. Hey, thanks, Margo. And uh, thanks, Ian, if you're still there somewhere. Um, and uh, just to uh, just uh, before I open the floor to any questions or comments, I will um, note that it's my hope that uh, Council will um, approve an intervention at the hearing on behalf of the Town of Sogging Shores. Um, and we will uh, hopefully have a discussion about that at a, at a meeting between now and the 26th of October 
uh, so that we can uh, get some approval around that and, and around what our uh, comments uh, might be. So, um, so certainly that's a, a discussion which will be pending at this council uh, in the near future. Uh, so with that, are there any uh, questions or comments from members of the committee? Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Margo and Ian, for your presentation. Um, I've got a, 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 my first question is about, um, and I know you were breaking up a lot, Ian. Um, at one point, you were talking about the um, process for um, decommissioning and for rehabilitating, I guess, the site. And I just missed um, part of it broke up when you were talking about um, the fact that there may be some foundational materials in place. And if it's attached to the bedrock, then uh, I missed from that point on. Um, was it that you were going to be um, then trying to eventually restore it so it would be as close to the original state as possible? Is that, is that what the intent is? Yes, uh, apologies for the breakup, uh, it doesn't usually happen, but yes, on the uh, material inside the bedrock, as we remove the foundation that's on the bedrock, that's some sense we're going to have to do, but if we go ahead and remove all the concrete that's in the bedrock, we just have to fill it up again with concrete. Uh, so, so what we propose to do is do a thorough survey and make sure that concrete has no radioactivity associated with it, and then we'll simply leave it where it is and fill any remaining voids with concrete back up to bedrock. We obviously can't recreate rock, but concrete is about as close as we can uh, imagine coming. Okay, that, that's very clear, thank you. Um, my next question is just um, talking, asking about what the volume of the um, used fuel bundles uh, how many use fuel bundles are there at Douglas Point right now that are going to be dealt with? And do you know what percentage of total used fuel that would be in Canada? Oh, um, <clears throat> there's actual fuel elements. There's about 22,000 of them, individual elements. Um, but in the photograph we saw uh, of the site in one of the early slides, the concrete canisters that you saw standing there those actually contain all of the fuel. So there's 40, 47 canisters there, 46 of them are full. One of them is empty. Um, the whole of ACL's fuels, uh, Douglas Point is not quite half of ACL's fuels. Um, but we are a very small proportion of Canada from the Bruce reactors as well. Um, so we, we're we're in the much less than 10% category of that's all of ACL. It may even be less than five, but I'd need to check on that. Okay, thank you. Um, my last question is just about something Margot talked about at the end, uh, where you were saying that there was information on about this on the town's website. Is that our town's website? Oh, sorry. Yes, I just meant the agenda for this meeting. Uh, you can access the presentation through it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any further questions uh, or comments from members? I don't see any. So, uh, well, thanks very much. I guess the uh, the areas of um, that I'm interested in, at least, are the, uh, the and you mentioned it in the uh, um, disposal of the sort of non-radioactive materials and as you mentioned some of that is slated for disposal in in this area in local landfills and I think that's an area that the town of Soggy Shores is certainly going to be interested in um, you know participating in uh, discussing with you and uh, and um, and seeing how that's going to play out so certainly some interest there I know from the town and um, and then of course um, and I can't recall from the county uh, presentation but there's a certain amount of this material that's going to return to uh, the radioactive material that's going to return to Chalk River um, and be stored there at your site there. That's my recollection. Uh, and so um, I think there's some, there'll be some interest certainly locally, certainly um, for myself at least, uh, in the arrangement uh, that um, CNL or ACL uh, has with the local community you know, at Chalk River, Deep River, 
um, to um, in terms of hosting that material. Uh, I know hosting low and intermediate level um, and high level uh, uh, nuclear waste materials is an issue here. And, um, and since there is no, actually there is no planned even long-term storage solution for low and intermediate level waste at this point, um, it appears as though the King Garden site is now the de facto permanent storage site until another process is settled on to find a new solution. So, um, so we need to discuss how, what arrangement there is between the owner of material like that and the host community um, for long-term storage if no other solutions available. So I think uh, for me, those are areas of interest and things that we need to discuss as part of this process. And there's certainly things that I'll be raising when council discusses it and, and, and hopefully discussing when we intervene at, at, um, at the uh, hearing. I don't know if you have any comments to any of that. Uh, I, I can talk briefly. I know you only had 10 minutes slated for us, so I'll try and be brief. Um, but certainly, as many of you may well know, there's an ongoing uh, um, environmental assessment regarding what they call the near surface disposal facility at Chalk River. And that will be to dispose of their low level waste. And uh, it's very clear in that, that that will deal with all of ACL's low level waste. Um, so it, it is the intention and it's very much uh, up there in the debates right now that uh, all of ACL's low level waste will be going to the NSDF. So yeah. uh, similar to what OPG, as you say, is seems to be consolidating at Western Waste. ACL is consolidating at Chalk because certainly that's where over 90%, if not 95% of the waste is already generated anyway. Sure. And, and so we'll be watching that process carefully and then I, and hopefully it'll be part of the broader discussion with this decommissioning. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. Thank you very much uh, for yeah. coming in and for giving us your time and we appreciate the presentation. Have a good evening. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you. Good night. All right, so that moves us on in the agenda to public, no, pardon me, there are no public meetings, to reports of municipal officers and um, 7.2 general government, which is a staff report on the 2019 financial statements and a presentation by Tracy Smith from BDO. Uh, and so we'll turn it over first to, uh, I see that I see the Director of Corporate Services come online. So Director of Corporate Services. Yes, thank you, Anthony, Mr. Mayor. I just um, wanted to say a few brief words before I let Dan and, and Tracy speak. I just wanted to thank both Tracy and Dan for putting all the hard work in so that you can have the most exciting meeting tonight with our financial statements, because I know everyone just is waiting for this night every year. Anyways, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of collaboration this year done totally remotely. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone involved. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sue. Um, so as Sue mentioned, so staff and BDO have now completed the audit work necessary to produce draft financial statements and those statements are now ready for council's approval tonight. Uh, no material changes to the financial results or reserve balances that were presented to council back in August have been made. Um, and certainly the adaptations uh, that, that we had to make in terms of COVID-19 COVID played an impact in the timing of the final completion of the work, uh, but we're very glad to be at this, uh, at this point in the process. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone on the BDO team, Monique, Fallon, Elizabeth, and uh, Tracy for, for all of their hard work in, in getting us here. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Tracy Smith from BDO and uh, she'll take you through her presentation of the statements. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen here. Um, so if you can let me know whether that um, worked okay. Yep, you're good. That worked, that worked okay? Yep. All right, um, so uh, um, I'd like to thank the council for inviting me to your virtual meeting here um, this evening. Uh, as Dan said, I'm, I'm Tracy Smith and I'm a partner with BDO. So I've taken over the engagement partner role um, from Michael Bolton on his retirement last year. So I was, I was in attendance at the meeting, but this is the, my first time uh, really speaking to, to the meeting. Uh, Elizabeth Alexander was the senior manager during the audit and has been working with your management team for a few years now. Um, unfortunately, Elizabeth had a conflict and could not attend uh, this, this meeting uh, this evening. 
Uh, we would both like to thank Sue and Dan and their team, especially Katie and Denica for their um, assistance during the audit. As uh, Sue said, it was a learning process as we navigated the virtual world and we, we do appreciate everyone's patience as, as we, uh, we completed the audit virtually. Um, so as your auditor, we have the responsibility to communicate with those charged with governance, um, which, which is you, the council. So this, uh, this report uh, with the picture contains all required communications under Canadian auditing standards. The, the communication is very similar year to year as the content is um, prescribed by, uh, by the, uh, is prescribed by the standards, um, um, prescribed by the standards um, and it, it has to be communicated on an annual basis. Um, I will provide a brief summary of this communication, then provide a very high level overview of the draft financial statements, because I know you've, you've gone into those in, in, in detail. Um, so I will stop a few times to, um, uh, if, there, if, there are any, uh, if there are any questions. Uh, so starting with the summary, the financial statements, they are a draft um, and, oops. They are in draft um, and they've been provided in Appendix A. Uh, the financial statements need to be approved by council before we can release them in final. Once we do have financial statement approval, we still then need to um, acquire a signed ma management representation letter dated um, as of the date of the approval and do subsequent events review up, on, up to that uh, approval date. Uh, amounts are material, they would affect the decisions of users relying on the financial statements. So the materiality we used was 750,000. As your auditor, uh, we provide reasonable but not absolute assurance. So we can't add at 100% of the transactions, especially with, virtually. Um, so we use that materiality to focus on high risk areas and to calculate the sample levels that we use in our statistical sampling. Um, our audit strategy and procedures were outlined in our planning report. Um, there were no changes to our plan procedures and no issues were identified in our testing that we perform um, and no additional risks were identified uh, during the audit. Uh, internal controls, uh, we did not find any deficiencies in the internal controls we tested during the audit. Uh, we did, however, have one recommendation um, relating to general IT controls and user access to the accounting software. Uh, we do understand that your management team has already implemented some changes to, to uh, strengthen this area. We confirm uh, with you annually that we are independent. Uh, the sample representation letter um, that I mentioned we have to obtain is in Appendix C. Uh, un, uh, uncorrected uh, uh, misstatements were required to report to you if there are any amounts um, that are unadjusted amounts that we found during the audit. Uh, these are detailed in Appendix B. And uh, since the total income effect is not material, we can issue an opinion that the financial statements are not uh, materially uh, misstated. So we didn't have any other concerns um, during the audit. If uh, council does have any concerns, I can always be contacted directly for, for, for any uh, um, further um, discussions also. So any questions before we go on to the actual numbers? Uh, yeah. Yes, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, Tracy. Um, this goes back to the question of um, materiality. Um, that's seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for the um, amount of materiality. Is that? I'm assuming that's okay. That's not something to be alarmed by. No. So, so, so that's uh, the industry standard um, is, is two to three percent of, of your revenue. So, so that is uh, an industry standard. And and what that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars is 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 that's a that's an overall materiality. So that would mean if, if there was a, um, a whole bunch of of errors and things that we found that were over seven hundred and fifty, then we'd have to. To, to look at adjustments and, and, and or, or, or qualify re, our report. We don't, uh, the 750,000 doesn't mean that we don't look at anything that's under 750,000. So, 
So what we use is, is called a performance materiality, which is actually 75% of that 750,000. And then from that performance materiality, we actually, um, in, in our testing, we're, we're looking at things that are, are 10 to 10 to 15 percent of that performance materiality. So um, I want to assure you that 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 we do look at some um, things that are 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 less than that that materiality. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, my, you, your pictures are on my far screen, so I have to turn my head. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor has a question there, Mike. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Mary Adam, and thank you uh, to BDO staff. Um, just if you could comment briefly on oversight process and uh, internal controls. Is this something that you, uh, you go into any great uh, depth, detail when you're speaking with staff about our internal controls and oversight process? Um, so, so yeah, so, so we do, uh, um, we, we, um, we look at the, the systems and the internal controls that you, you have, um, in, in place. We don't test, um, a hundred percent of those. We do rely on some of those, those internal controls and we, we, we test, um, certain internal controls, um, to, to, to make sure that the systems are working properly, but it's not a full, uh, it's only in respect to, to, to getting enough evidence on the, on the amounts that are in the financial statements. We don't get the, the audit itself is not a, um, a full test of all of your internal control. Okay. But some test, but, but some, some testing does happen during the audit. Oh, for sure. For sure. But, um, and then as part of our audit process, we can't rely on, on, on that a hundred percent. We actually do. Um, get down to the nitty gritty and look at invoices and, and, and look at um, the source documents too, as okay. well as the, okay. the controls. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anybody? Doesn't look like it, so carry on, Dre. Okay, so I am going to, to move on to the uh, actual financial statements. Um, so again, the full financial statements are in Appendix A. And um, I'm going to, to um, start with the, um, the audit report. Uh, so just give me a minute to get there. Um, so the audit report, um, it is longer. Um, um, this longer version was, in, uh, was brought into 2008, but it is standard with the, um, it is in accordance with the standards. So it is management's responsibility for preparing the financial statement. The auditor's responsibility is, is to give an opinion on the financial statements that have been prepared by management. Uh, the, our audit, uh, the opinion is now in the first paragraph. It is an audit opinion. So that's the highest level of assurance that we can provide by um, a public accountant. And if you'll notice in the second paragraph, um, uh, as in the prior year, there is a qualification re re relating to the completeness and existence of capital assets um, with respect to the timing and the recognition of when sub subdivisions, subdivisions um, of when the subdivisions were assumed in the past. So that that's been a that's been a qualification that's uh, that's been in prior years. Um, but our actual opinion is in the second paragraph there here. Um, so it's our opinion that these financial statements, um, except for the, uh, um, the qualification, they present fairly in all material respects, the consolidated financial position of the town in accordance with the um, Canadian public sector uh, accounting standards. The um, responsibilities of of management and those charged with governance are, um, are detailed, uh, defined in detail on, uh, on, on the second page of the audit report. Um, and then our auditor's responsibilities um, are detailed in, in length um, at the end. So, so again, it's a long report, um, but it is, um, it is uh, uh, in accordance with um, public sector accounting standards. On page five, uh, you uh, will find the, uh, the um, statement of financial position or, or sometimes it's called a balance sheet. 
So this is a snapshot in time on December 31st, 2019. So that seems like uh, so long ago now with uh, uh, the situation that we're in with COVID. Um, but these are historical fin financial statements to represent the, the, the transactions for 2019. The total assets um, um, at December 31st, uh, 2019, were $40.6 million, the largest amounts, um, the, the, the largest asset there being the, the, the cash and your temporary investments. Um, so there was a, um, a significant increase in your, in your cash um, position uh, of almost $8.5 million. And, and that's really a result of increasing your reserves. Your reserves increased $3.5 million and you also um, took out some, some some new debt, which brought some cash um, back into the the, the town. Uh, um, there was new debt of six point five million dollars. The total liabilities were thirty million dollars um, at uh, December thirty first. Uh, again, the largest amount is that long term debt, external long term debt, and you'll see that it has increased. Um, by $6.5 million um, relating to the, the uh, financing for, for the expenses that you had um, um, put out for the uh, police building. The other larger amount you'll see in the liabilities section is this deferred revenue of $9.6 million. So that deferred revenue represents your unspent, um, mainly your unspent development charges uh, um, reserve that um, are available to be used um, for your future capital projects in, 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 in the future. So they don't get recognized, they don't get recognized when as revenue when they're received, they get recognized as revenue when you um, spend them or use them for financing for your capital projects. That brings us down to our net financial assets of $10.5 million. So that's your financial assets, less your liabilities. And so that's a key financial indicator. Um, a, positive, uh, uh, a positive amount means that you do have um, uh, money in reserves um, and you have resources available for, for the future. Your non-financial asset, the largest is your tang tangible capital assets of 166 million. Um, that is at cost less amortization. So that's not at uh, your replacement um, value. That, that, that was what was originally um, paid for for the assets. And then you come down to your accumulated surplus of $177 uh, million. So that's the, oops, oops, not supposed to click, sorry. Um, so, so that's the equity that the town's built up over time, both monetary and your physical assets. So that includes um, your um, tangible capital assets, less your, your debt of 151,000. And it also includes um, $26 million that you have in uh, reserves and reserve funds. Moving on to the next page is the statement of operations. Um, so that's your transactions for the year. Revenues, uh, revenues um, include all your external revenues for both operating and capital. So that includes your capital revenues, does not um, include any transfers to, uh, to or from, from, from your reserves. So your total revenues were 38.6 million. Your expenses, uh, your expenses include uh, operating expenses and amortization. That does not include any capital purchases, nor does that include any transfers to reserve. So that's a little bit different than where how you budget. Um, you, you budget according to, to legislation, which allows you to not, to, to not budget for amortization. Um, but according to accounting standards, we were required to, to show it in this, this format. So your budget numbers of 23 million um, do not include amortization, but your actual expenses of 30.7 include um, amortization. So if you backed out your amortization um, from, from these actual numbers, uh, you would have spent 24.2 million, uh, which is in, in line with your, your um, budget. That brings us Mike down did. to the... 
Looks like uh, the vice deputy mayor's got a. Is it okay if we just kind of stop as we ask yep. as we go here? Yeah. Um, I just under the I circled under the expense line, uh, 2019 budget 23 million 822, and the actual 30 million 753, which is about seven million dollars. Can you just explain that number again for me? Why why the increase uh, in the actuals to seven million? Okay. Um, so, so according to legislation, you're allowed to not budget for amortization. So um, amortization is just an estimate of the use of your capital assets over time. Um, so this 23.8 million does not include amortization, which is, it, it's not a cash number, it's just a paper number. So this 30.7 million includes some um, amortization um, that's that's not an actual expenditure okay okay yeah does that make thank you oh it does thank you okay all right carry on Tracy. okay um and, and as 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 um um as i said you're you're on my third screen um your pictures are on the third screen so i have to look way over there to find you so just um please um just yell out if you want me to stop and and, and i can uh, stop and answer your questions um, the annual surplus, uh, so the annual surplus um, is um, seven point, oh, I keep clicking and I'm not supposed to click, I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, um, the revenues less the expenses give you an annual surplus of $7.9 million. And what is important to note is that that's not an operating surplus. So, so, so again, that 7.9 million had amortization in it. Um, and it's um, also from this 7.9, you, you now have to pay for your capital assets and you have to pay for your, your debt payments. Um, so, so it's important to note that that annual surplus is not an operating surplus. Um, so when we go to the next page, uh, we start with that annual surplus of 7.9. And then we add back the amortization that was included in the expenses of $6.5 million. And then we, we actually take off um, the 14.9 million that you actually spent um, in the year on your, um, your capital assets. Now, not all of that capital assets um, would be financed from, from, current, um, from current revenues some of the financing for those capital assets come from, from your reserves, which are still not um, reflected in, in this statement. Uh, so we do um, come down to a, um, that brings us down to the change in the net financial assets, which decreased um, a small amount. And, and this will agree back to your, your balance sheet, the change in your, your net financial assets on your balance sheet. The last main state statement is the statement of cash flows. Um, so this uh, reflects what actually happened with the physical money that's, that's going um, in and out of your bank account. So about the middle of the page here, we see that you, you brought in $17.6 million um, from, from operations. You spent 14.9 on capital assets. You had new debt um, come in of 6.5 and you repaid some of your old debt of a million dollars, which brought you down to your net um, increase in um, your, your, your bank accounts of almost 8.5 million to give you your ending $20.9 million. That's um, in, in, in your cash, um, in, your, in your, your bank accounts. So, um, I'm not going to go into detail in the significant accounting policies or the notes. Overall, the, the town is in good financial position. Uh, you do have positive cash flows um, with almost $21 million in the bank, and you do have um, uh, reserves of, of just over $26 million. So that includes a very high level overview of the financial statements. Are there any questions? Thanks, Tracy. I'm just going to have to scroll back and forth to see everybody. So put up your hand if you have a question, and hopefully I'll I'll catch you. Any questions from members? I'm not seeing any. Looks like you've already answered everybody's <laughs> questions. It's going to go. You've done a very thorough job, Tracy. Well, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, oh, maybe Mike's got one, uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I wasn't sure if we were finished there. Does that finish the presentation then? Yeah, the presentation is finished. If okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, just, uh, and, and uh, BDO have always done a, you know, a, a great job for the municipality and uh, my next statement is not meant to slight BDO at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's just a question for staff, uh, whether anyone has the answer to this question or not. You can send a, maybe a note out. I, I was just kind of curious what the, you don't have to answer this this evening. Um, but I was just wondering what the annual fee is for BDO to carry out this review. And, and secondly, um, again, this is not the slight, believe me, I, I, I think you do great work. But have we ever uh, tendered out the responsibility to do our annual audit, Mr. Mayor, other than BDO? And that, again, that, that's not a, you, you do a wonderful yeah. job. I just did quite a couple yeah. questions I have. It's an important question, and I think we have done it. I don't know if the director or the treasurer want to speak to it. The treasurer. Uh, yeah, so I don't have the exact cost in front of me of the annual audit, uh, but I believe we have gone to, to tender in the past. We're entering our 2020 financial statements will be the last year of a five-year commitment to, to BDO. And so next year um, uh, we can take direction from council or, or um, pursue whatever avenues you want in terms of how we go about uh, two, three Thanks. years. Thanks, uh, Daniel. If it was five years ago, I didn't know that. So that, that pretty much answers my question. Thank you. And if we could get that number at some point, I'd appreciate that number. Yep, I'm sure staff will get it for us. Are there, uh, that's good. My screen is back now. I can see everybody all at once. Are there any other questions before we finish with the presentation? I don't see any. So thank you very much, uh, Tracy. I think, uh, I think you're right to say that uh, these uh, Results show that the municipality is in strong financial condition as of the end of 2019 and, uh, and poised well, I think, to handle um, the current financial uh, situation that uh, we face and that the world faces. Uh, uh, so I think, um, you know, I appreciate uh, you giving us that overview and, uh, and that assurance. So thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Good night. Okay, so then that moves us on. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. I'd like to draw your attention to the recommendation in the oh. staff report. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. You so you politely drew my attention to it. It's good. All right. Uh, here we go. Yes, it's recommended that Council accepts the 2019 annual audited financial statements as presented by BDO. If there's nothing further, then I'll ask all in favor. That is carried. Thank you, and thank you, Linda. All right, then that moves us on to 7.3 infrastructure and development and we have three staff reports and the first one is a staff report on the Bruce Road 25 detour roads for 2021 and the director of infrastructure and development. Thank you and through you Mr. Mayor. Bruce Road 25 will be going through its third year of construction in 2021 and it'll be three of four years um, that that area will see construction. Uh, this year, the county and, ta and town staff have been working with GM Blue Plan to come up with a detour route that would enable access to the Goebbels Grove area through the construction of the third phase. This phase involves some very large, very deep infrastructure and a total road closure is necessary for this work to be done. We've discussed options with the adjacent landowner, the developer of Blue Water Estates, to come up with detours that would go through that property. And this is what we have asked uh, council to consider tonight. The work on Bruce Road 25 is proposed to occur in two phases if these easements and detour routes exist. The first will be the section between Ridge Street and Bruce Street. And then the second phase will be from Bruce Street to Highway 21. The detour along Ridge Street would allow us to um, do the work between Ridge and Bruce and then detour traffic into that subdivision at Ivings Drive and, and Ridge Street and around. Then when we finish that first part, we'll move the detour up to the Bruce Street extension. And that will um, push the traffic farther out of the residential subdivision and onto Bruce Street, which is already a collector road. Um, the idea with uh, doing it this way is that it may take a bit more time uh, or cost a bit more money up front, but the funds that are being spent are DC or development charge related anyway, and aren't wasted because that construction needs to be done in the future. 
So along Ridge Street, uh, we've already got in the 2020 to put the sanitary sewer in a trail connection through there. We will widen that trail connection to make it um, used for a road. And then on Bruce Street, uh, we don't see that there's going to be any infrastructure running along the future Bruce Street. So then this road base will be put down and used as road base in the future when Bridge Street or Bruce Street is finally connected. So with that, I'll answer any questions. All right, I'll read the recommendation, then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that council authorize entering into an easement agreement with Barry's Construction and Insulation Limited for the construction and maintenance of a detour route on the Ridge Street extension and Bruce Street extension as shown on the attached maps. And the council directs staff to prepare the necessary documents to finalize the easements. Questions or comments? The Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your good work here, Amanda. And I know the uh, residents down in uh, Baker Baker Street and, and Soggy Beach Road and other areas, I'm sure uh, Shipley will, uh, will appreciate this move and not having to detour around to concession four. So I think this is a you know, very good move and, and good planning uh, on your part. Um, I'm just uh, wondering a question I do have. Um, you've mentioned about the next phase from Ridge to Bruce and then Bruce to the highway. Are you saying that uh, all of that work then will be completed in 2021. Is that the plan? Is that the, that's the purpose of the rerouting? And once Ridge to, to Bruce is completed, then it makes Bruce important to uh, to reroute. And, and what about across the field? Um, you know, uh, I think are there still plans to to do the roundabout at the intersection of County Road 25 and Bruce Street, um, Amanda? And and is that is that is that part of the um, I guess the work for 2021 and is the work going to actually going to go across the farmer's field there in 2021 or is that 2022? Thank you. And through, yes, the construction is all for 2021. The roundabout at Bruce Street and Bruce Road 25 is to be constructed in 2021. When that work is being done, we may shift back to the Ridge Street detour. So it's nice to have these two options for the detour available. Um, but this these easements will only be for 2021. The 2022 work would be uh, Bruce Road 33 realignment. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Hey, uh, Councilor Schreiber. Sorry, uh, and through you, um, Amanda, those are fairly long stretches of road and lately we've had a few um, complaints or concerns raised about um, traffic calming measures. Um, where we've had in residential areas where there are long stretches. What will the traffic plan look like for stop signs or traffic or calming measures um, on Ridge and Bruce Street coming off of um, 25 and then heading up in through some of the residential areas by Stickle and Ivings Drive? Thank you. Through you, um, can I just clarify, do you mean on the detour road, like on the gravel uh, reconstruction road or in the permanent uh, asphalt piece? Um, I would say uh, I would say on the Ridge Street and the Bruce Street, the extension, so on the gravel road sections, but now we're bringing a, a, a pile more traffic in through those areas by Stickle and heading up Ivan. So is there anything on those roads that would be changed? And I don't know if that's speed limit or addition of stop signs, but also what would the speed limit be on those road extensions that we're going to do on the temporary basis? Thank you, and through you, the speed limits would be posted at 40 and it would be a gravel surface. Um, I haven't thought about putting stop signs in the middle because there wouldn't be any cross streets. So it would, it would um, be construction signage and um, reduced speed limits due to construction. On the existing neighborhood streets, the um, Ridge Street and Bruce Street would both come to four-way stops where that ends. Well, I guess it's Bruce Street would come to a three-way stop at sunset. Right. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I'll just uh, echo what the Vice Deputy Mayor said, Amanda. This is really uh, good work and I uh, appreciate uh, the effort you put into it. Heard a lot, I've heard a lot from residents down in that area this year uh, about their concerns. And so it's good to see that we're planning ahead and going to have a plan for a detour uh, for going forward. So I think that's uh, very positive and appreciate your efforts. So you've heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. Okay, then that moves on to the next infrastructure and development report, which is the staff report on the waste management master plan implementation and the director. 
Thank you, and through you, we're just looking for approval to continue the good work of GM Blue Plan and their waste management division to do the design details for the land uh, the landfill entrance in Southampton and also to start the EA process. Um, some of those funds will be brought forward as the 2021 budget is discussed in the operating budget and that would be funded out of the landfill reserve to continue with the EA of the expansion. So there is a recommendation, I'll read it. It's that council approved sole sourcing of GM Blue Plan to proceed with the design of the landfill entrance and environmental assessment for the landfill expansion as recommended in the waste management master plan with funding through the 2020 budget and landfill expansion reserve. Questions or comments from members of the committee? The uh, um, councilor Maya. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks Amanda for this. Um, it's, it's good to hear that we're finally getting a, a, a kickoff on the expansion of the landfill site. This is, I understand, a, uh, a lengthy process of, of getting a uh, licensing agreement for expanding our, our waste facility. Um, would it be safe to say this is the first step in a, in a long road? And, and exactly how long do you expect it would be before we uh, get to a situation where we can start to uh, move into the next area of landfill? Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. It is expected to be about a 10 year process to go through this and now uh, that's assuming that things go well. We did start with the master plan and coming up with the preferred solution. So we have done that analysis of multiple solutions and the one that we picked was site optimization and um, expansion. So as we're doing the site optimization, we may not need the landfill um, before 15 years, but uh, we expect to be um, ready to go within 10 to 12. Okay, and, and so is it safe to say then that by uh, tendering this work to GM Blue Plan, Blue, yeah, Blue Plan, that they've got a 10 to 15, 10 year contract with this or uh, does it renew periodically? Thank you, through. Um, the EA process, that one project would be um, through this 10 year period, I would suspect, unless there was something that we didn't like with what they were doing and we will enter into a contract that the standard municipal engineers associations and consulting engineers of Ontario has put together that has those clauses where we could um, look into if there's not appropriate um, performance. Oh, for performance, certainly, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's expected that the, the engineering company would be involved from start to finish in this. Some, some engineering company, maybe not them, but some engineering. Thank you, and through, yes, that would be done by professional engineers. Um, GM Blue Plan is selected because they're the ones that can currently do our monitoring program as well. So they wrote the master plan. They know the landfills very well, and, and I think we'd be best um, suited to go with them. Okay, further, uh, further questions or comments? Councillor Schreider. Uh, thank you, and through you, and I think just to follow up with that, um, Amanda, can you just remind me, did we do a tender and RFP to award the Waste Management Master Plan, or that was just single source to GM Blue Plan as well, because they do our monitoring? Through, I can't remember. I believe we did a tender. If you give me um, a minute to look it up in our... You could even shoot us an answer later on. That, that, that's no problem at all, not to put you on the spot with that, sorry. Um, but what you're asking for tonight, what is the cost of that? What would that contract be then with GM Blue Plan to do the design of the entranceway? That um, was in the budget for um, 80,000, I believe this year. So 10% uh, of that is up 8,000, uh, oh, $10,000, I would say for that. We don't have that uh, as a quote yet. Um, I can bring that back um, to you before it comes to council, if you wish. I think it would be important for us to know exactly how much we are um, awarding the single source for. I do think that there are some efficiencies with, with sticking with the same uh, company that are familiar with it, but I also think that we, um, to do our due diligence, I think we need to know, um, you know, did we tender it out last time? Or are we just continuously awarding to the same companies or not? Um, maybe there's other companies and GM Blue Plan is a great um, company. And I think that we use them quite often um, and they do wonderful things for us. But I just think we need to be aware of that too. But what is that What is that quote that we'd be approving them for tonight? That's fair. I yep. will do that. Good, thank you. Are there other uh, questions? I think that's important. And it's important that we don't set a standard where if you get one job, 
with the municipality once and you happen to, it happens to be the right one that then you get all the work for the rest of time in that same project. So I think it's an important, um, and I think there has to be a good justific a justification beyond the fact that we've worked with these guys for a long time and we still like them um, to carry that on, you know? So I think uh, it'd be important to, for you to bring us that information, Amanda. And um, I think as we go forward in this, um, you know, this may be one where we'll award it to GM Blue Plan, but as we go forward, I think you want to seriously consider uh, tenders in the future uh, to make sure that we're, because uh, our responsibility, council's responsibility is to make sure we're getting the best value for taxpayers too. And so we need to make sure that we're um, testing the waters every now and again. Uh, but anyway, uh, you've got uh, a recommendation before you, and this will come back to regular council in a couple of weeks uh, if you approve it. So I'll ask uh, all in favor. That's carried. So that moves us then on to item three, a staff report on the 2020 bridge and culvert inspections and the director. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Every two years, the bridges and sogging shores are inspected by a professional engineer. In 2018, some bridges were identified as requiring ongoing monitoring programs. And one of those bridges was the Cole Bridge, which is located on side road 1314. This bridge has been noted as being in poor condition and was recommended in this year's report to be closed within one year of the inspection, which would be May, 2021. When reading the report, staff reached back out to the engineer and specifically asked about uh, snowmobiles on the bridge during the winter. This bridge is not winter maintained, so it is normally closed December 1st and reopened in May. Uh, the engineer felt that uh, through what they saw in the monitoring program that the winter is the most dangerous time on that bridge because of how the um, abutments are being affected and did not feel that with snow loads and snowmobiles uh, it would be safe over the winter so they recommend if we're going to close it in May that it be closed temporarily starting in uh, December 1st 2021. With that closure uh, we would run the same process as we do with McEwing Bridge where it's closed temporarily we start the municipal class EA process where we go through agency and public consultation. A professional engineer analyzes the bridge, um, comes back with alternatives. One alternative will be do nothing, which would be leave the bridge in, in, um, in its current state and closed. Second option could be removal. A third option would be replacement and uh, another one might be rehabilitation. They'll um, go through all that with public and agency and professional opinions, come back, give council a preferred solution. And at that time, uh, council will be asked to vote on what to do with the future of the coal bridge. So tonight, what we're asking for is you uh, accept the recommendations of that report and then temporary uh, with that, close the coal bridge. Okay, thank you. We'll uh, read the recommendation, then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended the council receives the 2020 bridge and culvert inspection report prepared by GM Blue Plan Engineering Limited, dated September 2020, and the council authorizes the temporary closure of the coal bridge effective December 1st, 2020, until a municipal class environmental assessment is completed to determine future options, i.e. replacement or removal. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'd first like to start by asking that those two recommendations be separated, the, uh, the accepting of the report and the, uh, the motion to close the bridge be handled in two separate uh, recommendations for acceptance. Could that, could that be done? We can do that by consensus. Is there any opposition? I see no opposition. We'll vote on them separately. Okay. Um, so, um, Obviously, there's a, a great deal of history with this bridge. I'm not going to go back to 100 years or more, but um, but uh, my involvement with this bridge starts uh, in around 1998 or 99 when uh, when the former Saugeen Township rehabilitated the north side of that structure, and and then um, amalgamation took place, and uh, very little was done until uh, the next interaction that I had with that bridge was in uh, 2013 and uh, there was a public meeting held to discuss uh, that bridge along with the McEwen bridge, McEwen bridge. Um, and uh, I have the, uh, the report from that meeting back in 2013 here which I've recently reviewed and it, it's uh, it's clear to everyone I think that uh, 
that the condition of these two bridges over the past uh, century and uh, more recently the past uh, 20 years has been one of decline. Um, but there's uh, an equal sense there is um, a lot of sentiment amongst the neighbors around uh, these connecting links and the, uh, the one of them is is the need for maintaining a adequate north south route uh, as an alternate route if highway 21 should become impassable and uh, and with the current McEwing bridge closed um, this coal bridge I believe is the only other north south route unless you go all the way over to County Road 3 and up to Burgoyne and back in. So um, as you can understand, it's it's an important link from an emergency alternate route uh, point of view. And uh, it also is uh, very sentimental, especially to people who live in the area. Um, some, you know, the, the farm immediately, uh, the two farms immediately adjacent to the bridge um, essentially would be cut in half if they didn't have some means of getting across. So those people are very passionate passionate about it. The, uh, the bridge is also well-traveled. Um, I don't have data per se, but I can see that road from my kitchen window. And I do know that it is well-traveled day and night. And so the, the bridge is well used. I've reviewed the report. I've, I've been on the bridge myself many times up recently as yesterday, where I went down and reviewed with the pictures, uh, the uh, reported shift on the southwest abutment and uh and the uh bearing plate and that and it, and it certainly is a uh, a concern um the the abutments are coming in on the bridge and are um they run out of uh, compression room if you will on the expansion plates um but the, the the bridge is currently used by tractor and and truck with a, a limit of twelve thousand pounds uh, the last report that we had on this in 2016, uh, their conclusion was that the next step and that what was led to believe by neighbors and council alike was that the next step would be to uh, consider a, a further reduction in the load limit on that bridge. And, uh, and so um, this, this comes, this report or this recommendation to close the bridge comes as a, as a complete surprise to many people, uh, myself included. Uh, the snowmobile clubs, which use that as their uh, primary route since they uh, were unable to use the, the Mill Creek uh, trestle bridge. And um, so it's, it's uh, a lot of people think this is quite hasty. So what I would like to recommend is because the report uh, gave us one year from the, from the point of the report, which was May the 28th, I would like to make a motion then that um, the, to the decision to close the Coal bridge be deferred for the time limits outlined in the plan, uh, in order for a that a public meeting can be held with the affected residents and interest groups to hear the facts and be satisfied that all options and alternatives have been considered. Um, I I I can't put an engineering stamp on my opinion, obviously, but uh, in my opinion, if it can handle pickup trucks uh, by the the and, and cars by the dozens per day with um, no apparent uh, imminent failure that putting skidoos across it in the wintertime um, can't, uh, can't be as risky as that they're going to fall in. I mean, with the, the failure mode of compression, it's not like the abutments are falling apart, which would result in the bridge collapsing into the river. What's actually happening is the, the steel and the, the deck are, are being squeezed by the abutment. So there's no no chance of the of the bridge actually falling into the river, uh, which would be a more catastrophic failure mode. It's more that the steel and the and the decking are being compromised by this compression mode, which will certainly lead to further degradation. But um, that would be my recommendation that we defer this decision until at least the spring, and uh, and then have in the meantime, uh, hopefully sometime uh, between now and then, hold a. Uh, a public meeting where uh, either by Zoom or in person where all interested parties can, can come and, and hear the report, hear the opinions of the professional engineers, um, have their uh, alternatives and, uh, and discussion about alternate north-south routes, i.e. the McEwen Bridge being built hopefully next year, and, uh, and maybe look at some innovative alternative uh, methods for uh, maintaining that north-south route. So I would move that, looking for a seconder. 
There's a motion. I'm just I can't, it's seconded by the deputy mayor, and the motion is that this matter be deferred pending a public meeting on the subject, and, and that council would revisit it following a public meeting. Is that your intent? That is the intent. Yes. Okay. So that's been moved and seconded. We have a motion to defer on the table. Is there any discussion on the motion to defer? Vice Deputy Mayor. I, mean, I just want to thank Dave, Council Mayor. I, I mean, he's done, uh, you, you know, a whole lot of uh, good research on this. I know I spoke to Mr. Lamont a couple times in the last week, and you know, there's a lot of attachment to Coalbridge, and uh, you know, I, I just think what what Council Mayor has done here is a good thing, and uh, call for a deferral and and in a public meeting, and we really do need to hear from the residents, not rush into this. I know there's some, you know, certain sense of urgency to, to repair, or do something with the bridge, I get that part, but we really do need to hear, hear from the residents uh, in that area and have some good discussion on it before we say, let's 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 close it. So Council Mayor, great job. You, you've done a lot of really good, really good research. You understand it well, and uh, just want to thank you for your good work. Is there any further discussion on the motion to defer? I'll just say that, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I agree with the motion to defer. I'd like to hear from the public um, and those affected uh, by it. I also appreciate the work that Amanda and her staff have done as well as uh, our engineer. I think this is obviously something we need to deal with one way or the other. Uh, we need to involve the public in it, but we also can't overlook the fact that we have a recommendation to close this bridge because of some safety concerns and we can't, so we have to, um, it has to come to council. We have to decide one way or the other and we have to do that while incorporating the views of the people on that road and uh, their needs. So um, so we'll come back and hopefully um, we can get this organized sooner than later and make this decision so that we can have some certainty one way or the other. So, oh, uh, Council Schreier. Uh, sorry about that and through you. Um, I definitely agree with 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 Dave on this for sure. Um, and maybe a question to Amanda doesn't have to be answered tonight, but um, the report, the inspection that happened in 2018, um, has the condition um, deteriorated more or is the rating the same? And also, instead of waiting for another year or two for another inspection is could we retain GM Blue Plan to come back? Perhaps it's every every six months. Uh, or every couple of months, maybe now, if this decision is going to be deferred, just to keep their eye on the condition. But I, but I definitely agree with deferring that. Thank you. Through you, uh, that's exactly what we had done in 2018. So in 2018, they uh, recommended that the bridge be closed within one to five years. So we embarked on a monitoring program. So they have been monitoring the bridge going out. And when they did their May inspection, they said you should close it within one year from today. So what we were looking for today was um, that agreement that in May the road would be closed to traffic, but also closing it in the winter to um, non-traffic, non-vehicle traffic. The Vice Deputy Mayor, pardon me. Mr. Mayor, one thing I would like to see, uh, I meant to ask this question is, uh, you know, traffic counts on McEwing uh, Side Road uh, 1819 and and 13, 14 Cove Side Road. I, I wouldn't mind, uh, are they available, Amanda, like 18, 19, 20 years? Do you, have you ever done traffic counts on those two side roads? Thank you, three. we have done traffic counts. I will check to see if in the 2019 ones, those two roads were done. Could we, but, uh, could what you, I have, could, I can get to you. Yeah, could you make those available? I just like to mm -hmm. take a look at those two numbers. Thank you. So if there's nothing further, then we'll ask all in favor of the motion to defer. That's carried. Uh, and now we'll go back to the, the other half of the motion, which is uh, receiving the culvert inspection report to dated September 2020. Is there any further discussion to the rest of the report? I don't see any, so I'll ask all in favor of that. That is carried. All right, thank you. That then moves us on to 7.5, protective services, and we have one staff report uh, about the Victorian Order of Nurses and a nurse practitioner agreement and the Director of Protective Services. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Staff have been working with the VON for many months in an effort to bring a second nurse practitioner to Saugeen Shores based on the success of the first one. If approved, it's expected VON will begin recruiting process late this year and a second nurse practitioner would begin early in 2021. Uh, they'd immediately begin taking new patients and could roster approximately 500 patients with some capacity to do after hours and non-emergency care to uh, our, our seasonal residents and, and visitors. 
Both nurse practitioners would be located in the Saugeen Shores Medical Building in Southampton, working with the existing doctors. Um, some shared space uh, will be avail made available to them and dedicated space would also be uh, given to them. If or when the, the second nurse practitioner begins practice, the Saugeen Shores Medical Building would house five doctors and two nurse practitioners and be functioning at full capacity. Okay, thank you. I'll read the recommendation and we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that council pass a bylaw to authorize an agreement with the Victorian Order of Nurses to operate a nurse practitioner clinic in the Saugeen Shores Medical Building. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Deputy Mayor. And then we'll get Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you for your report, Phil. And uh, this is again, you know, great news. And I've, I've said many times over the years, I'll say it again this evening, uh, one, one orphan patient is is one too many. And uh, when you have 1,000, 1,500, or I don't know exactly what the number is today, but orphan patients, we're able to reduce that by 500, maybe 600, who knows? Uh, that's that's a, that's great news for Saugeen Shores. So for those people today that don't have a, a family physician, you know, maybe uh, we're, we're close to seeing hope, hope is on its way. And uh, that's, a, that's a real good thing for our community. Um, and this is, the next point is really, a, it's, it's not that significant, but I, I just uh, would rather not increase the, you know, we are operating, I guess our deficit to reserve for the, um, oper the reserve for this particular medical building reserve is, is in a $14,000 deficit, I think right now. And um, 11,000, I should say this would increase it to a $21,000 deficit for our reserve. And I'm just wondering, Mr. Mayor, and I, and again, it's not a big ticket item. It's not a big amount, but rather than increase the, um, you know, the debt reserve from, from 11 to 21, I'm just wondering about, um, is there a possibility that, you know, tax stabilization, future cap reserve, the perhaps physician recruitment reserve, uh, you know, rather than go further into debt, in, into that reserve. I just wonder if we could finance it in another manner. And, um, and also Phil, to fill through you to fill, uh, you know, perhaps we should, you know, the building's almost 20 years old now, um, you know, and I think that, you know, we're gonna see maybe more maintenance repairs down the line and maybe our annual contribution of $7,000 to reserve. You know, maybe we should look at this year to increase in that slightly. So Mr. I just wondering if it, uh, you know, if it's possibility maybe, um, you know, we could re redirect 10,000 from another another area rather than increase the deficit in that reserve. Director? Yeah, I, we can certainly look at that uh, for, for sure and other funding sources, but I will remind council that building's received some major capital upgrades in the past 16 months, a, a brand new roof, a full painting exterior, full painting interior. So we have depleted that reserve for, for the exact purpose it was meant for, where it was uh, maintenance of the building. And the building's looking really good right now for a, a 20 year plus old building. Uh, the $10,000 is an upset limit of $10,000. It will not be more than 10,000. And, and we hope for it to be uh, much less than that. Yeah. But we wanted to allow for some technology upgrades and, and modernize the spaces for, for the nurse practitioners uh, long-term. So I, I suspect uh, it will be much less than that. Um, and some of the interior painting and stuff we've committed to has already uh, been funded in other sources. Yep. So we, we will look for other funding sources than the reserve. Yeah, and then Phil, I certainly understand. I mean, I complete agreement with the 10,000. I, I have no issue with it at all. I just wonder if there's another source and, you know, there's heating and cooling and the building's 20 years old and there will be future repairs. So I just, but uh, anyways. The, uh, and there was a significant amount of money in that reserve just a couple of years ago, as Phil said, we've spent a fair bit of it. One thing about assigning this to the medical building through its reserve is that it attaches a, a medical cost to a medical uh, account in our, in our budget so that we can see, you know, this is what this is, you know, rather than put it in future capital, which is sort of drawing on our general fund. This is saying this is a this is a medical building related expense, and we're assigning it to the medical building. And then what we can do is pay up, pay off that debt through our operating budgets in future years, right? So as you've said, Vice Deputy Mayor, and I think you're right. Probably we obviously we need to get more money in that reserve because, as you correctly pointed out, that building is going to cost us money down the road. So um, that gives us the opportunity we can we can borrow from the reserve and then increase our reserve payments and balance it out. But then we've assign those costs, medical building costs to the medical building. And that gives us a, 
bit of transparency about what we're doing on medical. And, and, and Mr. Mayor, that, that makes perfectly good sense and it should be, you know, a cost to that building. And my last suggestion was perhaps we increase that reserve from 7,000 to maybe, you know, whether it's 10 or 12 or 15,000, Phil, but just think about that in our operating budget this year. Thank you. We will include an increase for your consideration. Geez, thanks, Phil. Are there any, are there any other, uh, uh, oh yeah, sorry, Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and Phil, thank you so much. This is really wonderful news. I know a lot of people are gonna be happy about this. Um, I just wanted to say personally, my family has been being, uh, our medical professional is our current nurse practitioner and we get absolutely top rate um, care. So uh, I'm really delighted to see our uh, Southampton Medical building at full capacity and that in that cooperative spirit uh, that the um, new nurse practitioner is being um, welcomed. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor, I would like to echo the sentiments that have been made this evening in terms of uh, welcoming what will be a new um, nurse practitioner to the community. Uh, and also give kudos to the, the physicians currently in our community who have who have stepped up to support this initiative, knowing uh, the near crisis that we are in in terms of providing uh, healthcare professionals for citizens in our community, uh, and, and that's that does not go unnoticed. Um, we we need all involved to sort of all hands on deck to find the right solution, knowing that we have a lot of obstacles against us, particularly given COVID. Uh, and, and what the future holds for um, physicians graduating from, from their respective programs. So this is wonderful news. Uh, Phil and the Physician Recruitment Committee have worked for a number of months to secure this, and we are very much looking forward to the arrival of not only a primary healthcare provider for a number of um, orphaned patients, uh, but also the ability to provide uh, health care to those who may be visiting and not able to to access that health care regularly. So it's it's a great news story and I thank you for highlighting it, Phil. Are there other, uh, thank you. Are there other questions or comments? I think and it's, I, it's important to really highlight staff have worked very hard on this for several months. It's been a very arduous and long process. Phil and also CAO Smith uh, worked on it uh, um, a lot, and so we owe them a great debt of gratitude for pushing, putting this one over the uh, finish line. And uh, and one important thing to note is, um, you know, when you recruit a doctor, and we have to recruit doctors, uh, but when you recruit a doctor, you recruit a person. In this case, we're recruiting a physician. Uh, and so, no matter who fills it, if somebody leaves or retires, you know, somebody back cut backs in to backfill that position. So, we, we're rostering 500 people, and those people aren't going to lose their primary care provider, there's always gonna be a, a nurse, maybe a different one now and again, but there'll always be a, a nurse there to look after them. Uh, so that's great and uh, and really valuable. So I think this is a, a great thing and thank you to staff for all that you've done on it. So you've heard the uh, recommendation uh, and if there's nothing further, I'll ask all in favor. That is carried, thank you. Oh, that moves on. Yes, that moves us on to communications and petitions for committee of the whole information. And there are seven items there. And does anyone wish to comment on any of them? We have the two items there. I'll just draw to your attention from the Southampton BIA and the Port Elgin BIA looking at uh, sat sidewalk patio and encroachment policy extension. Uh, we made those changes for 2020 in response to the pandemic and both BIAs would like us to extend it. My um, suggestion uh, would be that we um, ask staff to come back to us with the appropriate recommendations to do that. Um, so I think that uh, unless there's any uh, concern with that, I, I think that's what, how we'll proceed and uh, council can expect to see some recommendations on that in the next while. Um, if there's nothing further on any of those items, then we will move on to reports of department heads. And uh, the first one is an information report on the five-year collision data. I think that's provided to us by the Director of Infrastructure and Development. Am I right about that? Uh, I'm just kind of out of sync here, but I don't, uh, there she is. Uh, do you have any context for us on this, Amanda? You're correct. This, uh, through you, was a request from Vice Deputy Mayor uh, Mayette during the budget deliberation to ask if this could be presented. So yeah. this is data that is shared with Public Works. Our transportation consultant uses it, so I brought it forth. I 
don't have any comments on, on trends or um, stats in it though. Sarah, for council's information, I think one thing it shows is that we're focusing on the right intersections anyway. The, the uh, seems the most uh, challenging one is the one we're gonna spend the most money on in uh, 2020. So that's, uh, that's at least one positive thing, but it is valuable data for council to see. And uh, what always gets me about these, we used to get these on the police board all the time. Dave still gets them on the police board. And uh, the, it seems to me, and it still seems to be the case that most of our collisions occur when people are driving straight ahead in broad daylight uh, on, on dry roads uh, and they're not intoxicated. They're, perf they're in sound mind, <laughs> they're of sound mind and body. And that's when the collisions happen. So it's, uh, Mm -hmm. It's always me. It's always perplexing to me, but that's always one trend, and that's always been the case. So it's a, kind of an interesting thing. Um, so there's nothing else on that. The next one we have is an information report on the continued state of emergency for COVID-19, and the director of protective services. You want to make some comments on this? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just happy to answer any questions. Um, council is very aware we're in a continued pandemic. I wanted to bring the information uh, before council just just for any conversation or, or discussion. Um, I will say that it, it might be a little bit outdated and that the report was par prepared six days ago and a lot has changed in the province in, in the last couple of days with, with case counts. Not so much in our local area, but definitely heavier impact in, in regionally. And I guess the, the point I wanted to make in this information report is we've been operating in a state emergency for, for several months now, and we can't, we can't go on in a state of emergency forever. Council will have to make a decision, or, or more specifically, you, Mr. Mayor, will have to make a decision to end the, end the emergency at some point. And I, I just uh, want to continue to bring Council some information reports on, our, on, our, on the status of our emergency. I think that's important to do, Phil. And uh, I'll just make a couple of comments and I'm, into, I'm keen on any input from council on this. I don't intend to end this state of emergency without council's input. Um, and, but I, um, my own view at this moment uh, is that, and I'm as in a, a month ago, I may have said that we would be, might be looking at ending the state of emergency toward the end of September. Uh, I'm not of that view today. Uh, and for obvious reasons, uh, it seems the situation with COVID-19 is um, bad and worsening. Uh, and I think it's important for us to be clear uh, with the public that this is an emergency uh, and they need to treat it as an emergency uh, and they need to keep doing all the things that we've been doing all along um, to uh, stay safe. And frankly, uh, a little bit more than what we've been doing in the last few months. Um, including um, reducing your social bubbles and uh, seeing fewer people, uh, things that we don't want to do, uh, but things that we're gonna have to do if we're not gonna have a spike in cases. We've already seen even locally in the last several days and a concerning increase in cases in the Gravers region. And, uh, and so we have to take that seriously. And one part of taking that seriously is a clear message from the municipality that um, this is a state of emergency and the public needs to treat it as a state of emergency. So uh, um, those are my view. And one other thing I will um, mention to you is my view. I hope it's a view that you share. Uh, I'm sure it is that uh, we need to have enhanced uh, access to testing in the town of Saugeen Shores, uh, that we must have a testing facility for symptomatic people, not just asymptomatic people, but for people with symptoms of COVID-19. Um, we need a place for them to get tested in this community before the snow flies and sooner. Uh, I think that's critical. I've been talking to those with responsibility for that. I have to say, I have a great deal of confidence in all of them. Uh, Medical Officer of Health, Ray Bruce Health Services, Province of Ontario, they're aware of this issue and they're working on it. And, um, and, they're, and they, they know they need to enhance testing as well. And I believe that they are, are working on that. So, um, but um, I think it's a critically important thing uh, for us going forward. Are there uh, comments from council on this, uh, the deputy mayor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I wanna thank you for your perseverance and in, in working to get that testing center in Sogging Shores. The lineups in our neighboring communities, King Carden, Owen Sound and Hanover are lengthy. Uh, King Carden and Owen Sound, you must book an appointment and you're still waiting one, two hours. Hanover is a little better, but it's still lengthy. We do need that before the snow flies, the number of cases are rising and it is only a matter of time before it does reach Saugeen Shore. So we need to have, be looking 
to our people in our area and help take a load off of the other uh, treatment centers. So thank you for your efforts in that and, and please keep it up and keep us informed of how that goes. Will do. Uh, Councilor Mayan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, um, I agree with that, what Donnie said, uh, keep up the good work on that front, getting our testing here. Um, Sogging Shores is certainly looked upon as a leader in, in our area, in Bruce County, maybe even in Great Bruce County, uh, but this is not one of the areas we want to be leading in, that being coming out of the state of emergency. Uh, I, I think your comments are prudent that, um, that we should keep it up and, uh, and in fact, uh, double down on some of our efforts and encourage our, our citizens to do just the same. We want to keep our people and our children going back to school as safe as possible. And uh, I, I take what uh, what the fire chief said about uh, the fact that we cannot be in a perpetual state of emergency, but um, we have to be cognizant of the conditions in the community and in the broader province at the moment. And uh, this is not perhaps the right time. Hopefully the right time will be very soon. And I, I expect that you'll be consulting with your county colleagues and mayors from other other communities on on uh, when and if that uh, is an appropriate time thank you are there any other comments uh, from anybody on this uh, as i say i will can uh, and not just myself but the director and the emergency control group will continue to bring this question back to council periodically um, i agree with the director that um States of emergency I should not should not continue forever, and I and I I want to keep putting it back before you, uh, so that there so that uh, it's clear that there's support from the public um, through you as their representatives for this state of emergency. So um, so you'll be seeing this again, and we'll get the chance to discuss it again. Okay, thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, and then that moves on to the final information report, which is a report on the return to in-person meetings and the clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So as part of taking COVID-19 seriously, uh, this report is indicating we will do our part by continuing to hold our Zoom meetings until we can safely and effectively resume our in-person meetings. We haven't set a date, but we will continue to monitor the situation and report to council. I think that's uh, I think that makes great sense, Linda. Um, we'd hoped to be back together uh, sooner, but um, the right thing to do is to keep doing this and uh, and uh, we will do that. I can report to council uh, that the striking committee has considered uh, procedural bylaw amendments to make um, electronic meeting possible outside of the emergency in accordance with new provincial legislation. Uh, so you will be seeing a recommendation um, in the near future from the striking committee on that front uh, as well. So. Uh, if there's nothing further on that, then I will, that brings us to the end of our regular, uh, our committee, the whole agenda. So uh, we'll go to announcements by members and the deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as school has started, you will notice, and I'll say this again, that there are more and more students going out for lunch. Uh, please be wary as you're traveling the streets, the students are numerous and sometimes they're not paying the most attention. So. It is a busy time between 11 and, and 12 o'clock during the day. So please look out for our students at, at the Soggy District Senior School. Thank you, Vice Deputy Mayor. Yeah, just a couple of quick items, Mr. Mayor, and my, so my thoughts and, uh, and prayers certainly go to our friends at Soggy First Nations. Um, it's such a sad day. Um, take a look at you know, our historic Wesley United Church built in 1891. Um, I don't know whether uh, Phil, it's probably too early to see whether it was destroyed or heavily damaged, but in two other churches, French Bay and Scotch Settlement, I mean, it's just a, it's a sad day for our friends at Saugan First Nations, Mr. Mayor, and uh, you know, to Chief Anaquat and uh, our good friends there, thoughts are with you. And Phil, thank you for the, the great job. I mean, it's a difficult situation that you and firefighters have to be faced with, but um, these things do happen and, uh, I know it's been a long, long night, long day. So just want to thank our, our firefighters for sure. Um, I just want to comment on our uh, attainable, housing, uh, attainable Housing Task Force official launch. Um, we had over 200 registrants registered for last Thursday evening and it was a big success. We had a lot of great questions. And um, I, I, I just want to let the community know that the, um, the opportunity to conduct, to fill out a survey is still there. 
uh, it's sogginsurance.ca backslash attainable housing. We'd still like to hear from people. We received, Mr. Mayor, over 600 surveys uh, to date, which is really a, good, a solid number. And it really is a testament to, you know, the interest that people have with uh, in the area of attainable affordable housing. And uh, we're just in the beginning stages with our planning, but we've had our launch, uh, surveys been launched, um, the committee's been launched, um, key stakeholder meetings are coming up the end of October. And then we look at, we're looking at some community round table, uh, well, Maybe not round table up in the Rotary Hall, but probably be a, a you know, a virtual meeting. But however, we, we still want to hear from the community pertain, pertaining to attainable housing. So we have 24 groups lined up uh, that have shown interest uh, for key stakeholder meetings um, in October. I just want to throw that invite out there again to people. If you feel that you want to have a lot of some say and make your voice heard to do with affordable attainable housing, then um, get a hold of me. We get a, get a hold of uh, Councillor Cheryl Grace. Um, uh, and uh, Councillor Rich, and, and let us know what uh, you're thinking in terms of uh, attainable housing and, and, and register for one of our key stakeholder meetings. So, so far, so good. And we'll have some recommendations to Council by the end of the year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Schreiber. Uh, thank you. And, and I watched the launch meeting and so congrats to that group. It, I think it was just great. Um, Mike and Cheryl, um, I know that uh, everybody involved in that was, it, it was a great meeting. So a, a great first event. Um, two other things, just the Saugeen uh, Rail Trail AGM, Monday, October 5th um, at the Shoreline Baptist Church beside Home Hardware there in Port Elgin, I believe start time of 7 or 7.15. It will be on our website. Uh, so please feel free to join. Um, and also just congratulations to the Saugeen Shores Chamber um, for hosting Networking on the Green Golf Tournament uh, last week. It was a great uh, event, a big success. Uh, the clubs at West Links was a, just a, a great venue and the course was in great shape. So they provided uh, a really good uh, tournament and an event that uh, they had a COVID safety plan. Their measures were in place. It was, it was ran and it was just an enjoyable, enjoyable and uh, very safe event to uh, attend to. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Uh, I would like to highlight, many people are aware, but tonight is the first evening where the Coliseum is open for user groups. So uh, the Saugeen Shores Figure Skating Club is taking to the ice as we speak. And Saugeen Shores Minor Hockey will, uh, or perhaps they're, they're just wrapping up, but uh, uh, Saugeen Shores Minor Hockey will take to the ice tomorrow evening. Uh, understandably, the protocols that are in place are elaborate and for the protection of all involved, uh, and they are um, somewhat confusing for users. So I'm hopeful that uh, everyone involved, staff and, and in particular the users, will have grace as we enter the facility and do our best to keep everyone safe. Uh, the goal is uh, mitigating risk, and uh, we're looking forward to putting together a safe plan uh, to, uh, to get these kids back on the ice. I have just a little bit of insight into how hard minor hockey's board has been working on that uh, that uh, effort. And uh, so I have to say a huge thank you to you, Jamie, and uh, to your entire board, uh, because uh, I've just been, for a volunteer board, I've been working just seven days a week on that. So um, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor uh, Rich. Thank you to you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, the, the um, uh, Soggy Shores Meyer Hockey Association has been doing a great job. That executive board has been working really hard. Uh, I myself will be on the ice tomorrow at five, uh, first time in a while. So this should be uh, a lot of fun with uh, to have the kids out. Um, but I wanted to mention that in the last uh, Southampton uh, BIA uh, meeting, um, we started to turn our eyes towards Christmas. And, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes this year uh, with the way in which uh, we're able to celebrate Christmas within the community. But um, an idea was put forward that I'd, I'd like um, other people to know about that uh, we're considering or going to the chief of police and seeing if uh, we can have uh, what they would call a reverse parade, where uh, you might put uh, floats um, um, by GC Houston School um, in front of the um, um, museum and on down through and then have people drive through in between the floats um, maintaining social distancing not leaving their cars and then maybe having a little light show uh, down by the fire hall anyway i thought that was a very creative way of uh, getting around um, um, social distancing and uh, all that's going on in the pandemic and looking forward to a little bit of festivity coming up in the, in the christmas season that's uh, fast approaching 
So it's cool, John, and I'm sure you'll convey to the BIA uh, the willingness of the town to help them out uh, however we can. I sure will. Thank you. Councilor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to remind members of the public about the Lake Huron Coastal Conservation Centers uh, first in their series of uh, panel discussions and presentations about Lake Huron uh, and Great Lakes topics. Uh, tomorrow is the first one uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. It doesn't cost anything. Um, you can go on to uh, the Lake Huron Coastal Conservation website or their Facebook page to see um, how to, um, to see that. So tomorrow night, tomorrow's um, topic is on lake levels, which is something of course that is very interesting and of concern to many people, including us. So uh, I hope you have time to check that out. Um, and I'm sure that they'll have um, a tape of it, a recording that you can look at if you can't make it from three to five, since that's in work hours. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carr. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to, you know, recognize all of our small businesses again in our community. I don't think we can say it enough. We're heading into the off season at this time of year. The weather's changing. The patios are slowing down. The businesses that have been barely getting by managing with, with the restrictions that we've been put under at this time are going to find it even harder. We're going to start struggling more as we get into the fall season here. So I think it's even more so important, not that it hasn't been up to this point, but for people to really try and get out there and support our local businesses first before we hit that eBay and Amazon again. I know how busy we are. These carriers are bringing all this stuff into town. It'd be nice to see if we could see the local businesses sharing in some of this stuff at this time too. Thanks. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Maya. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, all I uh, wanted to report, well, I guess I was at a golf tournament where Bruce Power recognized all of the supplier companies that supported uh, their charitable efforts this year. That was uh, last week. And, uh, and we do have a very giving group in the nuclear supplier industry. Uh, so I wanted to recognize them. And um, myself and a group of dedicated volunteers are going to be going to Owen Sound tomorrow morning to collect eggs for our 2021 salmon hatchery. There was quite a debate in our club whether or not we would operate the hatchery this year under COVID uh, restrictions, but uh, the belief is that our protocols are in place and stringent enough that we're able to do that. So despite what you think the world might be going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, the salmon don't know about it and they're running in the river like crazy. We're hearing that uh, we're able to get our eggs in a matter of hours when normally it would have taken days. So nature continues to operate through the pandemic. That's a good thing. That's comforting. Oh, the deputy mayor's got something else. Deputy mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to add one little thing to the chamber golf tournament. Councillor Schreider and vice deputy mayor Myatt are a little, uh, kept it to themselves, but they were on the winning team. They uh, shot an amazing 12 under on 12 holes. So congratulations to them. Uh, I'd like to see their new revamped team from the team that was there two years ago. Uh, they did fantastic. I watched them from uh, a hole ahead, but Councillor Rich and I were replaced with two, I guess, better golfers, and, and they stole the show last week. Well, I guess uh, them's the breaks, Tony. The, uh, so I guess uh, I have... Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I was uh, wanted to congratulate uh, PowerLink. I was at the uh, sod turning for their development uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, so that construction is about to get underway. And I uh, was pleased to attend that. And I also uh, spoke to Women's Probus last week, uh, which was uh, good. And uh, we're starting to be able to actually several months where no events were happening at all. And there's starting to be some events like that happening again. So it's great to get out and be talking to folks in the uh, community uh, again. And uh, I also wanted to just echo uh, briefly the Vice Deputy Mayor's comment about our volunteer firefighters, because uh, I think it's really important to hit. And it wasn't just the Saugeen First Nation fires last night were serious and, uh, and uh, their work there was great, but also only a few days ago, they were responding to a very serious structural fire on Ivings Drive in Port Elgin, which could have been a very serious uh, situation, which was uh, prevented from becoming so because of our volunteer firefighters. Uh, and uh, I mean, just we should just every now and again remind ourselves how lucky we are to have that uh, that force of, uh, of volunteer firefighters in our community doing that work because, uh, gosh, if we didn't have them, uh, 
the trouble we'd be in. So, uh, so thanks very much to our volunteer firefighters and all of our first responders uh, for their hard work in the last uh, couple of weeks. It has not gone unnoticed. So uh, with that, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Gray, seconded by Councillor Smith. All in favor? We stand adjourned and we will stand adjourned until half past the hour. So it is 8.30 if we can get all members to turn on their uh, video. Mr. Mayor, we have all members present. You may begin. All right. Thank you, Linda. And then we will call to order this regular council meeting. And uh, the second item on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interest. Does anyone have a pecuniary interest they'd like to declare at this time? Seeing none, of course, you can do that anytime if you need to. We have no additions or deletions or amendments. We have no public meetings, so that moves us on to adoption of minutes. And we have the regular council minutes of September 14, 2020, and the Committee of the Whole minutes of September 14, 2020. And I have a resolution that council adopt the minutes of the council meeting of September 14, 2020, and note and file the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting of September 14, 2020 as presented. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Grace, seconded by Vice Deputy Mayor. Questions or comments to either of those sets of minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. That moves us then on to reports of the Committee of the Whole. And we have one report on the Community Services, Parks and Recreation report regarding the reopening of arenas. And I have a resolution that the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopts the Community Services, Parks and Recreation report dated September 14th, 2020, recommending that Council support the administration and the reopening of the Southampton Coliseum and the Saugeen Shores Community Complex in accordance with new COVID-19 protocols and limitations as outlined by the Grey Bruce Health Unit, Government of Canada, Province of Ontario, and Ministry of Health. Uh, is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Rich, second by the Deputy Mayor. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. That then moves us on to bylaws and we have one bylaw uh, and it's the resolution is that the following bylaws are hereby read a first, second and third time and finally passed and sealed this 28th day of September, 2020. 163, 2020 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw number 75, 2006 by Tony Lang Farms for lands described as 4659 Bruce Road 3, Town of Saugeen Shores. And 264, 2020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meetings of the corporation of the Town of Saugeen Shores. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Carr, seconded by Schreider. Questions or comments to the resolution? Seeing none, all in favor? It's carried. And then that moves us on to adjournment. I have a motion that this regular council meeting of September 28, 2020 hereby adjourns at 8.33 p.m. Is there a mover and seconder? Moved by Mayette, seconded by Carr. All in favor? We stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Have a good night.